This is a book that I have been working on for about seven years. And I did a little edited work on South Asia's big states. And I stumbled into it uh, because um, this country is one of the most pivotal states of the world, indeed. Uh, you think about it, uh, its role in the contemporary international security order, in the regional security order, its uh, importance with respect to peace with its neighbors in Afghanistan and India. What really bothered me was this lack of uh, explanation for Pakistan's insecurity predicament. I'm trying to understand why Pakistan has not become a strong state despite the immense focus on national security and military security and also uh, pro military preparedness over all other goals. People have studied uh, other regions trying to apply this European experience to developing states. You have a whole host of work on Africa by he Jeffrey, Jeffrey Herbs. And his argument is that African states did not become strong because they never experienced the wars of conquest that European states uh, faced. They had this abundant land, low population. They could focus on their urban centers, leaving their uh, hinterland underdeveloped. The assumed inevitability of a positive correlation between war and state making for state strengthening. And the examples of two examples that I would suggest that even winners need not become strong through war. France was a winner of World War I, Britain was a winner of World War II. Both declined and lost their empires. But we know that war did play a big role in the European context, uh, war preparation did. So the question is, why is that some countries have made it, others have it? I start off by arguing that in the post-World War II period, countries that have become strong are countries that focus on integrative power, internal integration, and external trade, and external uh, extraction from global marketplace. So countries that became what you call developmental states, focusing on internal development and external trade, became strong states, even when facing big threats. Pakistan is a very interesting case because initially they did have a focus on developmental uh, aspect under Ayub Khan, but later on that was taken out, it became more like a national security state with a little bit of religiosity attached to the strategy, etc. I'm interested in uh, two big uh, questions, and um, that is um, the big question that I'm interested in is, why is Pakistan such a weak state despite this intense focus on national security for such a long period of time. And the second question is, why is that its elite not reform their policies, change their policies, despite the results are not coming in positively? So the question is, this elite knows that they haven't achieved security or prosperity or unity, the three goals nation states have. And why haven't they changed their strategies over the last 66 years. And I developed an idea called geostrategic curse, which I think is perhaps the most original aspect of this book. There is a powerful literature that out there shows that if a country has too much of natural resource or too much foreign aid, it can develop a curse on it. It doesn't help, it doesn't innovate, it gets stuck in that uh, particular milieu. So my argument is that Pakistan has not done the kind of reforms that Korea, Taiwan, other developmental, other countries that faced extreme uh, rivalries and conflicts have done. And so that is because Pakistan has gone through this process and it is stuck in a kind of a developmental, non-developmental path. But this sort of structural argument, as we call in our, uh, our discipline, are not going to be enough for me. I want to be more eclectic and try to bring in ideas without claiming I'm a constructivist or any ism. I'm using some of the literature on ideas where I argue that uh, this literature on ideas really help us to understand what the elite is really up to, what are their thinking processes, etc. So I argue that these are, uh, this literature on ideas, they are shared beliefs, they provide causal maps, they create institutions on the basis of that. They create agendas, outcomes, and they can put blinders on people, leaders especially. They may not look at alternatives. 
and look at the George Bush team. This, by the way, is not just Pakistan alone. Every country has uh, leaders who have set of ideas. They may be uh, blind to other possibilities when they face different crises. But in this country, it's very interesting to look at what are the dominant ideas the Pakistani elite uh, uh, hold. And, um, and what is the sort of uh, source of that idea, th those ideas? I argue that the Pakistani elite is uh, basing its security on a very traditional Hobbesian worldview. Extreme conflict is the nature of international politics. The way a country protects itself is through military might. And that territorial and national security take on more importance than all other goals, trade and economic welfare, etc. You need two factors to make change in such a milieu. One is an internationally oriented middle class or a business class, a civil society wanting change. Because your ideas are so embedded. And or you need external actors with enough capacity and persuasive power to change your orientation. So if you have, you look at other countries in the world that went through changes from military rule to civilian rule proper, uh, they had uh, such changes, such uh, internal as well as external pressures. In Pakistan's case, unfortunately, it doesn't have a good middle, a strong middle class. And the number, they say 10 million, uh, but very difficult to say what exactly. It's a very tiny middle class. But you do have a civil society, the lawyers, for instance, fought for against uh, General Musharraf. You also have a very powerful media right now, very strong writing every day. And so, and what is the other source of change? As external actors, United States would have been the lead actor in changing Pakistan, but it failed miserably. And the U.S. says, you know, we try, it doesn't work. And the Pakistanis have a different expectations about what the U.S. ought to do. It's very important to show that it is not inevitable that a country remains where it is. It depends a lot on what strategies and policies the elite offer. And you look at these cases, South Korea was not secure. It had a huge enemy in North Korea and China supported. But it approached security in a different way and maintained both security and economic prosperity. So alliance relationship was very important for them and they became what you call developmental states. Their argument was that uh, if we don't develop our economy, popular protest, people will be unhappy and that they will start questioning our national security, affecting our national security uh, negatively. So national security was uh, uh, important but trading is important as well. War and war making are no longer the way to go to become a strong state. You need to adopt a trading or developmental state approach and also use non-coercive methods to integrate your different sections of your society. Pakistan does not do any of that. That is part of its challenge. Pakistan has not allowed its younger generation to globalize in the right way. It has not given them the education. Now, they will blame the outside world for doing all that, but clearly they have not focused on the right strategies that would bring prosperity to Pakistan. So I argue that Pakistan missed out this benefits, whatever benefits one can see from intensified globalization. None of the uh, crises have been turned into as an opportunities, and therefore we need a major change. The way Pakistan looks at security, I mean Pakistani elite, security, development, what a state exists for, what are the goals you need to achieve, are you going to get all these territorial conflicts, or you want to wait until everything is settled, everybody else makes concession, or whether Pakistan can achieve those goals, plus a developmental goals as Korea has been able to. So major changes needed in the way Pakistan looks at strategy uh, with respect to security, what uh, the goals that it uh, really needs. I think others can help marginally, at least the U.S. needs to talk about development and trade rather than uh, uh, returns or giving money for aid or for transactional reasons. China, another case where it needs to put a lot of emphasis on economic development, making this as a part of like a Korea rather than just a military alliance to fight uh, or balance India. India can stop building more dams or even if they're building, try to create a condition by which the Pakistanis agree with that, 
or give them some electricity or whatever under uh, concessional rates and that try to build a more uh, uh, better relations with its own Muslim minorities. And of course, uh, despite all this, I think the main focus should be the strategy of the Pakistani elite. Others can only marginally help, of course, uh, help. And the Pakistani elite need to rethink what they stand for in the 21st century, whether they want peace and security for the rest of South Asia or for the world, or want to continue in this downward spiral toward perhaps a nuclear war. So I will stop with that rather unhappy thought. <laughs>